At the heart of Russia, the Kremlin, the citadel of the Tsars, the seat of the government of the Soviet Union, and now the residence of the Russian president. For centuries, it has been a symbol of supreme power. It is also in this sacrosanct place that a priceless treasure can be found. It has been through wars, revolutions, love stories, tragedies, and bloodshed. Once, the power of Russia had no limits. Its rulers were cruel, extravagant, and deployed in incomparable splendor, greater than that of the great Mughals of India and the Shahs of Persia. Only the largest stones, the brightest, had the privilege of adorning their jewels. The majority of the treasure was acquired in the 18th century. Surrounded by the best jewelers, Tsars were bringing their diamonds from India, from the legendary Golconda Mines. They bought the most expensive stones, reaching astronomical prices that no sovereign could imagine. In search of scarcity, they sent emissaries to the court of the Emperor of China. The treasure of the Tsars has never been stolen. The protections that surround it are such that nobody can even imagine stealing any jewel. The finest Ceylon sapphires are part of it, as are the finest rubies from Burma. The gold mines of the Urals provide metal to make the most sumptuous settings. In the markets of Western Europe, they purchased diamonds from Brazil, newly discovered, with which they speckled their jewelry. The finest emeralds from Colombia were also coveted by the rulers of all the Russias. But all these demonstrations of power collapsed in the early 20th century. In February 1917, the supreme power flickers before collapsing. Rumblings of revolution run across the empire. The Bolsheviks take the Tsar and his family prisoner. The imperial family was awakened at night, after midnight. They brought three chairs, one for the Tsar, one for the Empress, and a chair for the Tsarevich. Great duchesses were behind them. The political commissaire arrived, with a number of guards, indicated to the Tsar that by the order of Moscow he would be executed. The Tsar did not understand. He said in Russian, Sto, sto, what, what, what's happening? He turned to his family, and already he had been shot. The Empress tried to make the sign of the cross, and she did not even have time herself, as she was shot, as were the duchesses in a quite appalling carnage. The Empress and the Grand Duchesses had hidden there in their clothes an amazing amount of jewellery, several kilos each. What happened at this moment is that most of the bullets were deflected by the gems and thus prevented a quick death. In the clothes of the Empress was the fabulous ruby of Rasputin. In the clothes of the Empress, we found the famous ruby of Rasputin. My grandfather, Colonel Alexander Fermor, liked to tell a quite amazing story. 
This ruby had been offered to the Empress by Rasputin, a mad religious monk who was introduced to the imperial couple to heal the Tsarevich, who was a hemophiliac. The bright red ruby was supposed, by some mysterious force, to stop the bleedings which were becoming more and more common in the sick child. According to legend, in fact, the ruby is cursed. Rasputin, who owned the stone, first was murdered by Prince Osupov. The Empress died with her family in Ekaterinburg. The curse continued in time. When the ruby was found, it was given to the commander of the Red Army, Trotsky. He fell into disgrace and was assassinated in Mexico. The ruby remained in the Soviet Union, which, after a number of years, eventually disintegrated. The fate of the Tsars is marked by the history of these jewels that bring us back in time. Frédéric Boucheron, who's the founder of the House of Boucheron, in 1858 settled near the Place Vendôme in the Palais Royal and opened a boutique that very, very quickly became the provider to all the crowned heads of Europe, in particular to the Russian court. We found a picture that represents the Tsar and the Empress, and we noticed that she's wearing a small tiara, which we did not know whether it was one of ours or not. We were absolutely sure now that it's a tiara that was made by us for the Empress. What's very interesting is to see at what date it was purchased. And then we found it in our book of orders for 1894. So we know that His Imperial Highness Monsignor the Grand Duke of Russia went to Windsor Castle via Paris for his official engagement to Alexandra. He stopped at Boucheron and he bought this tiara. It was quite a sentimental gift, a gift of love from a young fiancé who'd been in love for a very long time. It was a very passionate love affair that they had lived. We think that this little tiara that we lost track of, we didn't know at all what it had become, was worn by the Empress or one of her daughters when they were killed. Countess Alexandra Cheremetiev, who was my grandmother, was maid of honor to the Empress. So she attended the coronation in Moscow on May 14, 1896. She keeps in her memory this ceremony, which took place in an absolutely incredible pomp, borrowing from mysticism and with great religious fervor. In the twilight of the 19th century, precious stones from around the world converged on Russia. The pageantry was at its height. It was impressive. There was the horse guard who was there, the lancers of the guard, the dragoons who formed a guard of honor several kilometers long. There was an incredible number of guests. In particular, the emir of Bukhara, who was there, wearing a turban which was literally studded with precious stones and made a very big impression. The Tsar would have liked to wear the crown of Monomak, that was 850 years old, which had a key advantage. It was very light. It weighed about one kilogram and was lined with fur. 
But the protocol did not permit this. He had to wear the ceremonial crown of Catherine the Great, which weighed close to four kilos, a crown that is covered with precious stones, of course, about 2,000 diamonds. Couverte, bien sûr, de pierres précieuses, à peu près 2000 diamants. The Empress wore a dress which was embroidered by the nuns of the Ivanovsky convent. The dress was studded with 10,000 pearls. On her chest, the Order of Saint Catherine, tied with an enormous diamond. L'Ordre de Sainte Catherine, attaché par un énorme diamant, c'est le Tsar. It is the Tsar who raises the crown to her head. Sa couronne. Supreme power is given to the Tsar through the highest dignitaries of the Orthodox Church. Sumptuous and solemn sacrament, of which Nicholas testified in his diary. Everything went on in the Cathedral of the Assumption, and it still seems like a dream that I can remember my whole life. This is an old Russian tradition, the famous monomic crown, with which were crowned the first Russian Tsars. In the 15th century, Tsar Ivan III, grandfather of Ivan the Terrible, ceded his throne and his crown to his grandson, Dmitri. Then, with the same crown, all Tsars of the 17th century were crowned. Then, Russia became the Russian Empire. In 1721, the coronation ceremony was changed. A different crown was made for each empress. This was the case throughout the 18th century. Catherine I, wife of Tsar Peter I. In 1762, when Catherine II ascended the throne, she said she wanted the most dazzling crown in Europe. Jeremy Posier, the court jeweler, was called to this work. The crown was carried out in two months. It was so beautiful that the curator of the Royal Treasury of Great Britain, Lord Raining, wrote in his book that it was a hymn to the diamond, created during the Age of Diamonds. So this beautiful crown, which has no equal in the world, served during all the coronation ceremonies, including that of the last Tsar Nicholas II. As in all European royal courts, the Russian court was drawn to diamonds by this precious stone that symbolized the splendor of the court, and this splendor experienced a greater and greater degree of importance in the 18th century, notably with Empress Elizabeth, and especially with Empress Catherine II, Catherine the Great. Therefore, under the reign of which, a number of very large stones entered the imperial collection, and one of the most impressive, the Orlov diamond, which adorns the scepter of the Russian court, which is still preserved in Moscow. So we have before us a replica of the Orlov diamond. It's part of one of the legendary stones of the imperial collection and derives its name from Count Gregory Orlov, a favorite of Catherine II, who allegedly gave it to him as a present. Then it was part of the imperial collection and it is now one of the main jewels of the Russian court and therefore of the Diamond Fund of Moscow. 
et effectivement cette pierre donc This stone which caused much ink to flow over time is full of adventures and has often been paralleled with another stone of which we have a reproduction here the great Mughal another of those great legendary diamonds whose only trace was in the description given by Jean-Baptiste Tavernier in the 17th century one of those adventurers who traded with Russia, especially in diamonds and precious stones, and tells the story of this phenomenal diamond, which could be the Orlov diamond. The history of this great diamond began in southern India, near a city known for centuries, Golconda. This legendary place near Hyderabad remained the largest diamond producer in the world until the 18th century. The biggest and best known diamonds came out of its ground. These stones stemming from bloody, incredible stories would grace forever the jewels of the world leaders, especially those of the Tsars. Even today, the mighty city walls stand tall. They have protected Indian diamonds for centuries. Long ago, their discovery was made in a rather surprising way. In this fertile region, a farmer went each morning to his work. One day, he was sowing his field plowed the day before. By throwing a handful of grain, his gaze was attracted by a burst in the furrow. He had never seen a stone so brilliant. In a hurry to monetize his find and fascinated by the beauty of the mineral, but without knowing what he had found, he picked it up and went to Golconda, the nearest town. The city was a scene of trade and commerce of all kinds. For a few coins, a jeweler bought the stone, and then it passed from hand to hand, and the price and rumors about it quickly increased. The Golconda diamonds had just been discovered. The search began immediately, and huge stones came out of the mines. They supplied royal courts around the world, and mainly the Tsars. My name is Vijay. My name is Vijay Kumar. My family has been uh, yes, making jewels for 125 years. Uh, 125 years. My great-grandfather started his business in the neighborhood of Charminar at Golconda. In the Charminar area. Golconda mines, no, the mines are not there. There are no more mines in Golconda, but diamonds are still very renowned. And the, Their luster is unique. If, you'll see the if you compare these diamonds mines, and those of other mines, mines, you see an obvious difference. difference these diamonds see. have an incomparable radiance, and, and their presentation is beautiful. Very good. These mines have produced and, uh, a large number of diamonds, of, diamond of different nice. colors and varieties. And, uh, you can find, uh, Nobody uh, knows exactly uh, when production uh, began, uh, under uh, Kuli Kutub Shahi, I think. No, things are... Uh, Many went abroad. And all all the stones from this region were from surrounding mines. Golconda has become a name synonymous Actually, with high value and obvious high quality in a okay. diamond. Luster is different. So we can say it is good mine. To say that a stone comes from the mines of Golconda means that it is exceptional. My name is, My name is Khaled Muhidi. This fort, have got a long history. this fort has a long history, more than 500 years. It was built around 1518 by the Kutchahi dynasty. 
and built by Qutub Shah's. Some historians date its construction back 2,000 years. What we call Golconda today is a construction that dates from the 16th century. It was a very rich region. Extraction of stones was not done in the immediate vicinity of the city. It was famous for the industry of cutting and polishing diamonds. Pearls used to come from Arabia. During this period, the most beautiful pearls came from Arabia and Persia, and the most famous diamonds from Golconda. Tavernier, the famous French merchant and dealer in precious stones, came here at the time of the great Mughal, Aurangzeb, and he saw the diamond that was part of the treasure. This diamond had been cut and, according to the adventurer, its gross weight was about 500 carats, 100 grams. In his writings, Tavernier had estimated that 60,000 people worked for the industry's cutting and polishing diamonds. Many famous diamonds, and especially the most precious treasures of the Tsars, the Orloff and Shah diamonds came from Golconda. The city was so rich that the great Mughal Aurangzeb decided to appropriate it. He doted on the enormous diamonds that imposed respect for his power over his empire. After a siege of six months, a betrayal allowed him to take possession of the city. In the Hindu might, these uh, idols, these deities are very much respected. They feel that everything is coming from there. So, In Hindu mythology, idols and deities are very highly respected. People feel that they control all events. Throughout India, and here too, these deities are represented with gold, precious stones and platinum. All precious materials were used to make very rich deities. Sometimes their eyes were diamonds. It depends on the richness of the place, the temple and its donors. Diamonds were also used to heal. We were convinced of their healing power. We thought that by affixing them to the skin, by drinking the water in which they were washed, certain things happened. It was also believed that they had some effects, even the power to poison. They were the subject of many beliefs. All the nobles respected them a great lot. That is why this industry has been so successful. That's the reason that this industry grown. It is in the temple of Surangam in southern India that the incredible story of the Orloff diamond begins. The temple is situated on an island on the Kravarib River, protected by seven fences. Only a few followers and guards are allowed to go beyond the fourth fence. One night, a French grenadier deserter who had converted to Hinduism and a devotee of the temple, for several years, managed to steal the diamond, which replaced the eye of the main idol. He ran away and sold the stone, which went from merchant to merchant and finally arrived in Amsterdam. The history of the Orloff diamond is rather complicated and contradictory. It was also called the Lazarev, which was the name of its previous owner. The stone was given to European monarchs, but nobody dared pay a price so exorbitant. Catherine II, dreaming of the most exceptional jewels in monarchical Europe, bought the diamond. She paid for it for seven years. Grigory Orloff, her favorite, was only an intermediary for the sale. The name Orloff was given to the diamond on the evening of the Feast of St. Catherine, November 24, 1773. And that night, it was shown to the court. It rested on a red cushion, and the court, looking at this stone, whispered, Orloff, Orloff. Thus, the stone became known as the Orloff. From a purely gemological standpoint, it's a faceted stone. It's cut as an Indian rose. At that time, the stones were carved in trying to keep the maximum weight. The unfortunate Count Orloff did not keep the heart of the Empress. On the contrary, she chose a new lover, 
to whom she offered a diamond weighing 54.12 carats, now estimated at more than 15 million euros. The lucky recipient was General Potemkin. Catherine II's jeweler dismantled the jewels of the treasury that were no longer fashionable to make the coronation crown. He recovered a red stone, known at the time as a broom ruby, which was actually a red spinel. Close to a ruby, but less rare and worthless. This spinel was brought back from China in 1672 by Russian ambassador Nikolai Spaferi and given to Tsar Alexis I, said to be the very peaceful Tsar, the father of Peter. In the 18th century, it adorned the crowns of the Russian empresses, changing from one crown to another. It was the famous jeweler of Catherine II, Jeremiah Posier, who made it. From that time, it served at the coronation of all the emperors. He set this enormous red spinel at the top. I work at the University of Moscow. Eleven years ago, we put together a gemology laboratory. Obviously, large spinels weighing between 200 and 300 carats were of great value. Generally, we know their history, those of the mines where they came from, too. One of them is in southeastern Pamirs. It's called E. Kulai. Regarding the stone of the great imperial crown, its origin is vague. At the time, people did not distinguish spinels from rubies. Once scientists determined the difference between these two stones, they found many treasures in many large stones were not red rubies. This was the case here in Russia. At the time when these red stones entered into the Russian treasury, analysis did not exist. In the end, it turns out about 70 to 80 percent of them are spinels. This is also the case of the large red stone on top of the great imperial crown. In the late 17th century, diamonds from India became increasingly rare. At the other end of the world, at the same time, a new country, Brazil, had discovered huge diamond deposits. Russian rulers quickly became major customers of this new producer. Eu me chamo... My name is Antonio Carlos Fernandes. I'm a historian. The colonization of the Minas Gerais in Brazil by the Portuguese began in the early 17th century, beginning around the year 1690 and continuing through 1715. Colonization, which began with the South, was motivated by the exploitation of gold, which, in the state of Minas Gerais, had a flying start. The hamlet which formed here would be of fundamental importance to the exploitation of the gold mines. Meanwhile, together with gold, stones were discovered with great ease, diamonds, which emerged at the surface in the gravel explored by prospectors. Thus, local people, without knowing its value, and even without knowing how to manage this new commercial discovery, used these stones in various ways, even, according to local legend, for card games.
Foi um padre que sabiamente e já em contato com a Europa. It was a priest already aware of things and in touch with Europe, conscious of the value of the diamond, who made the first unofficial shipment of these stones to Europe. Clearly, this news could not remain limited to Aral de Tijuco or to the secret of this single priest. The news spread like wildfire in Portugal, and people flocked to the region very quickly. The diamonds sent to Portugal, to Lisbon, have played a role of such importance in the balance of Portuguese finances that the king bought special attention to the Aral de Tijuco and did not allow any miner to have free access to the city. And this took on such proportions that in less than half a century, the Europeanized and colonized world learned of the existence of the diamonds of Brazil. Slaves of all kinds were brought here. Até então, europeizado, colonizado, passou a ter notícia dos diamantes produzidos no Brasil. E mais a mais. Diamonds were used largely to repay various debts incurred by the Portuguese government to the British crown. It was perhaps one of the biggest beneficiaries of the process of searching for diamonds. But these diamonds also made their way to different European crowns, the Bourbons of Spain, the Bourbons of France, Catherine II of Russia. Mas não diferentemente, esses diamantes também foram para as coroas europeias, para os Bourbons da Espanha, para os Bourbons franceses, para Catarina II da Rússia. Ele foi compor as joias, foi compor a coroa, foi compor They were used to create real. jewels, crowns and royal scepters. Absolutistas europeus do século XVIII. It's still possible to observe the full activity of the operation of the mind in Diamantina, involving various garimperos. This activity still produces many jobs and incomes. Small and large, Brazil's diamonds were used from 1762 to cover the jewels of Catherine the Great. Aside from her disproportionate taste for destroying her enemies and choosing her lovers, the Tsarina was making her empire shine. She was surrounded by the greatest artists, the best jewelers. The intellectuals of that time rallied to her cause. They were German, English, and some French writers that included Diderot and Voltaire. Catherine embodied her empire, Russia. She said during a bleeding, let all the German blood in me run out so that all remains is that the Russian. The greatness of St. Petersburg was the luxury of its palaces. Peterhof, the residence of the emperors of Russia, with its fountains, waterfalls, and gardens, was the idea of Tsar Peter I in the early 18th century. His desire was to match the splendor of Versailles. Too small for Catherine the Great, 
a half century later, she doubled the area of the gardens. Similarly for the Winter Palace, she enlarged it by adding a trifle, the Hermitage. With a kind of frenzy, but with plume and prestige, she built, beautified, and restored her empire. But one of the most beautiful sights in the Imperial Russian opulence is without a doubt Sarsko Selo Palace, which remains today the largest in Europe. This palace's construction began in 1711, under the reign of Peter I. His daughter, Elizabeth, who succeeded him, transformed it with a Baroque luxury that was unheard of and compared to a heavenly constellation. The Empress transformed one of the rooms into a unique wonder of the world, the Amber Room. Its incredible story seems to draw from fiction. This room is covered with thousands of pieces of amber. Amber is a precious gem usually used to make jewels. Here, what is incredible is that the jewel is the setting and we ourselves are inserted into it. Its surface is nearly 100 square meters. It is a square of 10 meters by 10, and it has 7 meters high. Initially, Frederick the Great, Emperor of Prussia, had ordered from his master amber workers an amber cabinet measuring only 36 square meters in surface. All this amber came from the Baltic Sea coast, formerly belonging to the Prussian Empire, later Germany. A city, Dansk, located in Poland, made this its specialty for centuries. It trained the best amber craftsmen in the world. They supplied the European royal courts with the finest and most excellent creations. The the locals who were involved in the cutting of amber are the living history of the art of this region. The most prestigious period in the craft of amber is the 16th and 17th centuries. It's from this period that the amber room dates. It's the largest and most prestigious undertaking that man has ever conducted. My name is Zbigniew Strzecik. I'm a master amber craftsman in Dansk. This city and amber have crossed the vagaries of history. At the time of the supremacy of the Teutonic Knights, extraction, collection and cutting and the trade of amber were highly regulated. Those who did not have a lease to exploit it and that collected it anyway were punished, sometimes but through capital punishment. The importance of the quantities of amber in this region of the Baltic Sea are the result of the movement of a glacier, which, when receding, made amber deposits rise to depths ranging from 20 meters below sea level to just 5 meters from the surface in the Kaliningrad region of Russia. Around Dansk, these deposits are around 20 meters deep. We can also pick up amber on the beaches, especially after strong winds from the northeast and after storms. The waves unleashed by storms tear the amber from the sedimentary layers of the seabed. The resin fossil, dating back tens of millions of years, has a low density and floats on the salt water of the Baltic Sea. Mosaics, furniture, chandeliers, all made of amber by order of the German court, the Prussian king Frederick William I, were later offered to the Tsar. In 1701, the Emperor of Prussia asked a master amber cutter, Gottfried Wolfram, to start decorating a room all in amber. 
Five years later, one wall was ready, then another, and finally the king ordered to cease the work and store the panels in an arms room in his palace. When Peter I, Tsar of all Russians, went to Prussia, the future German emperor offered him 18 crates containing the famous amber room. In exchange, his imperial majesty received a ship built in the shipyard of St. Petersburg. 30 years later, the Empress Elizabeth remembered this wonder and asked the architect Rastrelli to integrate it into the Sarcocello Palace. Lavish parties were held there at the time of Elizabeth and Catherine, but also all of their successors to the throne. The Amber Room went through the centuries, wars and revolutions. But in 1941, Germany declared war on Russia. The rise of the Nazis was fast, and the same year, they invaded the city of Pushkin, where the palace of Sarkocello is located. They remained there three and a half years. Within 36 hours, the panels of the Amber Room were dismantled and sent to Konigsberg, Germany. The Nazi regime said it was essential to do everything necessary to return this masterpiece to its homeland, Germany. Fortunately, the majority of works of art had been put away before the invasion. In January 1944, the Russian armed forces broke through the blockade of Leningrad. A spectacle of desolation was before them. The palace had been partially destroyed. In turn, German cities suffered massive bombings. The Soviet army entered Germany. The Amber Room was dismantled in a rush by the Germans and first hidden in the basement of a castle, then evacuated far from the combat zone. Its location remains unknown. Konigsberg Castle was left a ruin. At the end of the war, Allied forces found many works of art stolen by the Nazis, but not the Amber Room. All that was kept of this room were some pieces that had been evacuated to Siberia with the collection from the Amber Room. So, for the reconstruction, we have the following documentation. Photos taken before the war and small pieces of amber belonging to the chamber, which helped a lot. First, they showed us the color. Everything you see here is artificially colored. All this was cut under a microscope. The method is as follows. On the inside, it's hollowed out, and below we put gold foil. In this way, although all the elements are flat, they appear to have a relief effect. On April 10, 1979, the Russian Council of Ministers resolved to recreate this masterpiece. A donation of $3.5 million from the German company Ruhrgas AG allowed to create a scientific research center which took care of the study, restoration, and conservation of the Amber Room. In 1997, some pieces were found in a private collection in Germany and returned two years later by the Minister of Germanic Culture in Russia. Well hidden or destroyed by bombing, the mystery of the Amber Room remains intact, and many assumptions have been made without any success to find it. It remains a beautiful challenge for treasure hunters. On May 31, 2003, St. Petersburg celebrated its 300th anniversary. The Russian president, in the presence of many heads of state, including the German chancellor, 
unveiled the Amber Room to the world. It had been fully restored, or should we say, completely redone. Twenty-five years of work and six tons of amber allowed for this miracle. Catherine the Great, Empress of all the Russias, was very fond of gems, especially diamonds. For her, accumulating them was a way of marking her power, but also a real pleasure and a game. She would say, oh, I would like to play cards by putting diamonds at stake. It reminds me of the tales of the Thousand One Nights. The most outstanding jewels of the treasure of the Tsars were gathered and produced during the reign of Catherine II. But nevertheless, her successors also excelled in the accumulation of jewels, purchased at great cost, or sometimes given as gifts as with the strange diamond named Shah a half century later. This diamond adorned the throne of the great Mughals, and it is the Shah of Iran in 1829 who hastened to give it to the Tsar as a gift to make amends for the devastation of the Russian embassy in Tehran and the assassination of Gribidov, its ambassador. The gift was accepted and allowed for conflict to be avoided. It is a large stone. The purity of the engravings of the names of former owners from the 16th and 17th century seems impossible to attain on the hardest material that exists, the diamond. After grandeur comes decadence. The people are hungry. Power escapes Nicholas II, the last of the Tsars. The treasure falls into the hands of the Bolsheviks. Lenin declares that it must be preserved and that all the treasures born from the oppression of workers and who until now were the exclusive property of the dominant classes must be opened and accessible to these same workers. The treasure of the Tsars was exhibited in museums. Thus, a government commission was responsible for evaluating and separating objects of lesser artistic value, which were auctioned off. At the time of the Russian Revolution, much of the crown jewels and jewelry of the imperial family were transferred to Moscow, where they were inventoried for the first time in a very scientific manner, as of 1922. Before that, some were separated. They chose to retain only the jewelry that had historic character, stones, and most famously, the regalia, that is to say, symbolic objects of power. They were then kept in Moscow as a national treasure. However, another part of the jewels, tiaras, badges, decorations, jewelry, miscellaneous things, were sent to Christie's and were part of the many Soviet sales organized, like this one in 1927 in London. And it's true that many pieces were sold on this occasion. Today, some are located in collections, notably in the United States. But sometimes it still happens that some of these pieces reappear on the art market. In November 2006, in Geneva, the Sotheby's auction house was selling a jewel from the Imperial collection. For me, it's something special because it's a diamond necklace from the Russian collection of Russian Imperial family. This dates from between 1760 and 1780. That's to say, under the reign of Queen Catherine the Great. I can tell you that my colleague and I, neither of us knew exactly what we would see. The customer put the case on the table. Upon opening it, it was extraordinary, because we immediately recognized what it was. But it was completely unexpected. It was a huge shock for both of us. Because for someone who works in this business, and especially who's a historian of jewelry, to come across something like this happens once in a lifetime. The gems of the treasure of the Tsars, vectors of divine light, 
fed the power of the monarchy for centuries while fascinating their subjects. Destiny makes men disappear, as powerful as they may be. But the jewels remain. Is this not a form of immortality? <laughs> 